Welcome to the Houdini Huli Challenge series. So, SideFX is holding a 31 day challenge where artists create a piece per day for a month based on a daily topic. I have decided to do the challenge and record each day's work so you can all see the process. Why am I doing it? Because I am a hooligan. If you're in it with me, feel free to use the hashtag hooligans Instagram and I'll be sure to reply to your post. But yeah, let's get straight into it. Okay, so it's day two today, that is wind. I know day one feels like it was just yesterday. It's crazy how time flies. Yesterday, I bit off more than I could chew. I think I spent about six hours on the effect and then another four hours editing. And then I stayed up late trying to figure out the rendering. And then the render wasn't right, so I re-rendered this morning. Um, I don't want all of that to happen again. So. The plan is to keep it a bit more simple from now on, but mainly focusing on the look. So simpler effects, but better looking effects, I guess, if that's possible. Um, today's one, fortunately, uh, I've already started, but it's built up from something that I already had. So in Houdini, I'm just going to show you basically how it works. Um, it's not right yet. There's, there's a lot that isn't in place, but I'm going to show you what it does. So, I have a circle. What happens is, over time, it spins, right? So, you end up with that shape. Skinned and converted to a polygon. So then you have this. Then I convert it to a cloth. So I have my constraints and my cloth geo. Trail node to generate velocity. So, as you can see, when it does this, it also generates velocity. That is useful later. Uh, also have a time shift node, time shifting to the first frame so that I have base geo to work with if I want to do anything with the circle. So this goes into a dot net already. Uh, okay, where was I? Yes, so I was showing you this over here, basic circle, right? So that goes into a dot net. So this dot net over here. And this dotnet is quite simple in that um, my constraints are animated, right? I fetch the constraints and then with a sub solver, I adjust the shape of the constraints so that this thing pulls like this. And then I also transfer the velocity from this piece over here. So remember we have the velocity, I transfer it every frame onto the simulation, right? And I also have some pop wind uh, I can't actually remember why. I think this is oh, it's just for basic noise. Um, so you end up with some interesting shapes. And then that gets sent into the vellum cloth cleaned. So as you can see, dot input output, that's the vellum cloth, vellum object, vellum IO gets brought in. Um, this needs to get saved. So I save it out. Let's do, so I'll save that to disk. When it's cached out, you just have something like this. Um, quite an ugly simulation actually, but you can see that it's being constrained into this position. But it also has a bit of give, right? It's got some of its own like natural movement and that's given from that wind. And so then you can post-process that to smooth it out so that it's not so ugly and then file cache that as well. So got cloth that is now processed. Then you UV project so if you take a look at the UVs, let's see a UV uh, quick shape. You can see how the UVs look. Um, they're a bit of a mess when viewed from this angle. Actually, wait, if I could UV, pretty sure that there's a labs auto UV that might be better. Okay, yeah, we're gonna use that. Then you attribute copy that over so that it's the same at every frame, right? So that's cool, you have UVs on that. Um, if you don't have this auto UV thing, and you would like it, you need to add the game dev tools to Houdini. Um, I can't remember where you do it. Yeah, I, I, I can't remember, honestly. So I will link it below. It's not very complicated. It's like a five minute setup. And then you can also have a whole bunch of extra tools that are in beta, which are really useful. So yeah. Then that gets poly extruded so that the cloth is a bit thicker. Um, apply normals, clean off any attributes, 
And then in this second chain over here, what's happening is we're getting this edge. And the reason that we're getting that is so that we can have like a, a nice edge, I guess. Um, I, I can't think of anything that has it, but basically, you know, when it gets um, sewn over on the edge so that cloth doesn't fray, um, that was kind of my idea behind it. Also, I'm noticing that this fuse isn't doing anything because there's clearly a gap over there. So let's increase that fuse. Clean, merge, cool, right? So now you can see you have this edge over here. So I'm not sure why I have cloth front out and cloth side out. What I imagine is I had two different UV sets, one for when it's rendered from the side and one for when it's rendered from the front. But I don't need that anymore because of that labs thing that I just did. So we can remove that. We'll do cloth front out. Yep. Okay. Cashed out. Cool. All right. So now the cloth doesn't look too bad. Um, it's got a bit of movement to it and it does that spiral. So once that is done, we take that into cloth disintegrate. Over here, we fetch that cleaned cloth base. So that's this, uh, this up here. Go to cloth disintegrate, then group the edges. So once I have the edges grouped, I pass that into this solver, which does a growth effect. Now I'm looking at it and I just realized that it would probably be smarter to use our cloth over here and then do this edge thing over here. I don't actually know why these are different, but I'm going to take this one instead because for some reason it worked better over here. I'll take a look at what I did now and I'll tell you why that's an issue. Um, Ah, I gave it a minimum edge angle. So I'll use this instead, All right? So now it's just cleaner. And then plug that in and can call this one edge instead. So my solver just has a growth, a little simple growth setup. So that as this grows, it gains the growth attribute. And you can take a look at that if you drop down a color node and you ramp from attribute. And let's go like black to red and use growth. So you'll see that it has a growth attribute that spreads out over time, right? So at a certain point, it starts spreading because what I want is for this cloth to swell and then disintegrate, right? And it needs something to tell it when to disintegrate. So that's why I'm using this growth, uh, growth solver. So on the other side of this, we have a point deform and it's deforming the base cloth. So what I'm doing here, time shifting to the frame where I want the growth to start, remeshing it, and then fracturing, right? So you can use an exploded view over here, and you can see how it's fractured, right? Into all these little pieces. And it's quite a nice fracture. Uh, it's not very uniform, and it's because I used the curve. So you can see the curve is just basically a mess, but it works. Uh, and then you pass that into an edge fracture, pointy form those pieces, right? So this is still fractured. And if you take a look at the exploded view, you can see that it's fractured, but it keeps the animation, which is really cool. So you transfer the growth onto that. Vellum cloth. So now I have some cloth. Um, weld them together based on those fractures. And it just connects everything. So everything gets connected. You have your constraints that go out. They're time shifted to be clamped to 144. Remember, we cashed out to 144. And if your simulation goes past 144, and you don't have a clamp, you can actually take a look at what that does. You go to 144. Please don't crash, Houdini. I know you, you've been giving me a heartache recently, but um, yeah, just do, do this for this once. Okay, I'm actually gonna save before I do that. So you go past 144 and you see you have an error, right? Because past 144, nothing exists. So you switch on your time shift and it gets clamped. So the last frame exists past that point. So that's useful, useful tip if your geometry actually ends at a certain point or you only have a certain amount cached. Okay, so that cloth disintegrate, you end up with geo and constraints. That goes into a vellum disintegrate. Um, I have a pop object set up over here. This was when I was testing for um, turning this into like a glitter, so like an explosive effect at the end. And then from here, what this does is it runs that same cloth sim, right? So it's like pretty much exactly the same. It's close, so it's not exact. And over here, I have my constraints and I'm copying over the attribute. Uh, actually, not copying anything over. I don't actually know what's going on there. Um, we'll find out shortly. But anyways, so as this goes, 
I do believe I should have like an attribute, yeah, attribute triangle. So if growth is greater than zero and frame is greater than 48, then do these things, right? So glue to animation, it no longer follows the animation at stop. It's now free to basically simulate and then break threshold, I set to zero, so it starts breaking up. And that's only when growth is greater than zero. So I'm passing on that growth attribute. So as that growth affects it, it should start disintegrating. So we go to cloth disintegrate. Uh, oh, nope, sorry, we go to cloth out. And over on the side, I have this dot input output and then save that to disk. So now we're going to print 240, right? Um, because it was until 144 because I just needed that base animation. But after this, we have the fracture. And I actually, there was something I didn't mention, but there is a pop axis force. So the fractures start swirling around and it's animated so that the swirling is kind of interesting. Right, so that's simulated. End up with that, right? So now it goes like this, fractures. File cache, very unnecessary. I don't even know why I have it yet. I'm gonna remove this one. UV project, which is probably also unnecessary. Uh, okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do the UV labs thing, so. UV labs auto UV. Yeah, this is probably fine. Okay, so we'll use this. And then this goes into post process so it gets smoothed out. That gets fed into this over here, transform the UVs down a bit, I believe. Yeah. And then clean them, clean off attributes, group anything that's broken off. So you'll see that when it reaches this point, those get added to the group. So then the idea is the ones not in the group will get one material. The ones in the group will get another material. Um, and then over on this side, my plan is to do a particle kind of thing. So frame 174 is when I wanted to like turn into particles. They go to 174 and then I have a particle setup. So I source in the particles as a pop wind and a pop torque. Basically it spins them and stuff. So then that gets fed into a pop solver. Now what I'm thinking is that I wanted to just sort of poof, <laughs> for, for lack of a better term, I just poof that, just kind of disappear into nothing very quickly. And so I'll probably do some randomization on the P scale thing over here. But anyways, I copied two points, some circles, because I actually wanted it to be like little bits of confetti or like glitter. And so I figured that this might be a good way. I'm not sure. I don't have this cached out yet, but what happens is P scale is keyframed. So it decreases over time so that this, when it turns into glitter, very quickly just disappears. What I do want over here though, is a channel wrap so that different pieces of confetti or glitter disappear at different times. And I'm actually going to need to cache this out for this to work. Hopefully you'll be able to see what this looks like. Oh, I have it reversed. So, yep, yep. Right, so some of them disappear very quickly. Others take longer. So then this will get a material as well. All of these are materials that I'm going to need to, you know, um, put together. And so then what it does is it switches from this fracture to these particles. And we also switch between our main geometry. So if you take a look over here, this is our uh, front out, right? It's that really nice geometry that we have. This over here. And then when the fracture starts, it switches geometries. Um, the other thing that we want is we actually want these two to have the same material. So I'm going to create a reference copy, put that in over here. But yeah, okay, so we have all of that. So I'm going to go into texturing right now. And when I'm done with that, you can see what we have.
So that's it for day two's project. I just finished the redshift materials, um, figured out the iridescence, and figured out how to do some redshift instancing. And so the final product looks like this. So once again, remember, if you want to join this challenge, uh, you can go over to the side effects website and check out the Huli contest, H-O-U-L-Y. Um, there's a forum where you need to post all of your work. And then you can also post it on Instagram. And if you want to, you can mention us um, at nine underscore between. And also you can use the hashtag hooligans and I'll be able to see your work. That's H-O-U-L-Y-G-A-N-S. So thanks for watching and I'll see you tomorrow.